17 years ago, my life forever changed when I was announced the second pick in the NBA draft. My dreams were fulfilled that day. Now RJ Barrett is faced at that same turning point, and we have so many things in common. We both were all Americans, we both played basketball at Duke under the Hall of Fame coach, Coach K, and we both were projected top five NBA draft picks. But the overall business landscape and the opportunities are drastically different now in 2019 as opposed to back when I was drafted in 2002. So two days before the draft, I sat down with RJ Barrett and his agent, Bill Duffy, to get a better understanding of what the real game plan for success really is. I've known this man since I've been 17, 18 years old. Mm -hmm. One of the best agents in the game. I know you guys have a history because Steve Nash is your godfather. I think of it as a guardian angel. He said he's great, you know, with the history with Steve Nash, he was his agent, so still is, but. Yeah, man, he's, he's all over the place. He's everywhere, and I'm thankful. Duff, you, um, when's the first time you saw RJ? When's the first time you, you knew that there was something different about him? Well, you know, knowing his father when he was playing with Steve on the Canadian national team and being impressed with, you know, Rowan and Keisha, his, his wife, um, you know, I knew of him before he was born because I knew if they had a child, how that child would be reared. That being said, you know, he's a global citizen. You know, he grew up in France, played in Canada, came to the U.S., so he's met every challenge and threshold. When did you first recognize that this game was going to be a business? Because obviously I, your upbringing is different than a lot of other people. I kind of really realized just recently because when you're, when you're growing up, my parents definitely helped shield me away from, you know, kind of most of these things. And then now that I'm actually, you know, starting to get invested into it, I'm starting to see more of the, the business side of things. Take me through the draft, Duff. So now we're, he's eligible for the draft. What's the process like? Uh, you guys have only seen one team, the Knicks, right? Um, why have you only decided to see one team? Well, it wasn't dissimilar to your experience. That's very true. We only saw one team, the Chicago yeah. Bulls for you. Um, we've identified a team that we like, um, analyzing the draft range. Um, so we're pretty comfortable with what, how we positioned RJ. When you make yourself eligible, everything just gets thrown at you at once. What do you mean everything comes at you at once? It's like a million business offers come at you because now they can actually talk to you and then, you know, you get calls and stuff from like, hey, I'm your second cousin. Like, I don't know you, like just different things like that. You know, you really have to make, make sure you have a you know, core group of people that you trust. Rowan, his father, is, is very meticulous if you know him and very organized and he has a basketball background. So the learning curve and transitioning from being an amateur to a pro is pretty seamless. So he's been training in L.A., you know, two times a day, working on his game, his ball handling, his shooting, and I've, I've seen unbelievable growth. So that's the core of it, right? All this other stuff is great, but, you know, the trigger and the engine is his production on the court. It, the money that you're about to make, RJ, I, I know it's not about the money because you focus on your craft, and I know who you are as a person. Uh, have you taken any time to think about, I'm about to make X amount of money, how, what do I want to do with my money? What things do, do you want to invest in things? Is that you know, an ambition of yours or are you just focused solely on playing your sport right now? Definitely focused on, on playing my sport. Like my thing is like, I can't wait till summer league. <laughs> like, you know, I'm just excited to play again. But I don't know, I, I kind of thought about it one time. I'm a goofy guy, so I thought about it. I'm like, whoa, I'm going to have a lot of money. Like, this is crazy. <laughs> that's, the, that's the priority, I guess, with my money. Definitely making sure my my parents are okay, my little brother's taken care of, like just, just that type of stuff. RJ's not thinking about this, that flashy stuff. He's thinking about substance mm. and his legacy and being a great basketball player and winning. So we're here in New York now. Does it feel like home? It does. Uh, I, I, as soon as I landed, I was able to see, you know, my family. I, I have a family that lives in Brooklyn, so, you know, they came over to, to see me and it's just, it's, it was great. You just turned 19, man. Mm. 19. Like, but I saw you on first take the other day and they asked you about you know, playing for the Knicks and you're like, I'm built for this. Mm. I'm sitting there at home saying, wow, like a guy who's 19 years old says, I'm built for this. Do you understand that comes <coughs> along with this market and, and being here at this location? I've been preparing my whole life and I just think if you put in the work, then you have nothing to be worried about. I feel like I work really hard on my craft and all I can do is give 100%. So if I work my butt off, give everything I got, normally it always ends up, you know, successful for me. 
I see you wearing a nice pair of Balenciagas. Um, <coughs> clean, by the way. Respect. Thanks. Tell me about this whole shoe process. Where are you guys in it? Um, what do you feel about it? Yeah, so we're evaluating various opportunities. You know, we haven't reached an agreement yet. We're a couple of days before the draft, so um, we're going to be very patient and diligent, uh, make sure the alignment is suitable for RJ. Um, I do think there's a premium because he's in New York, but we're talking to the major players and whoever RJ's comfortable with. The interesting thing and the unique thing about RJ, and this kind of reminded me of Yao Ming, is that he's going to have a full portfolio aside from the sugar opportunity. So that's going to allow us to be even more selective in, in the alignment with the relationship. But the shoe game is a big part of the player's brand. Have you always been in tune to the shoe game and what's going on? Yeah, I love my shoes. Um, I'm always kind of paying attention to, to, like, I can tell you, you know, who's with which company because I just, I watch all that stuff. I knew I would kind of be in it one day. So I watched who's with Adidas, I watched who's with Nike, I watched who's with Puma, I watched who's with, you know, everybody. And so I'm just, I'm kind of all around now and just trying to, you know, like Duff said, evaluate, trying to get to, to a deal. But Duff, you, you've done $3.5 billion in contracts. By the way. You never dropped that bomb on me, by the way. I did not <laughs> um, you got a little portion of that. A little bit, a little small <laughs> sliver. Tell me about the first player that you repped. How'd you get into the game? Wow. So, uh... You know, I played basketball at the University of Minnesota, transferred to Santa Clara, and there was a young man who played at St. Mary's, which was in our league, and he was a, his name was David Cook. He was a freshman when I was a senior, and I started doing this business you know, pretty quickly. I was drafted by the Denver Nuggets myself. So I recruited David Cook, and he ended up being a rookie undrafted, and I got him a deal with the Sacramento Kings. It was my first contract, and he made the team. So that started in 1983, 84. So. You really got drafted. I got drafted. <laughs> it's kind of <laughs> tough for me because I'm like, you know, I see him now. I'm like, he played ball. Like, he got drafted. Like, there's some, there's in time for everybody, you. somebody will look at you one day and be like, oh, you played ball. I know you were born in 2000. I didn't grow up in the social media era. Mm -hmm. So for me, I've seen a lot of people when they post, they just don't think they just post. Oh, this yeah. looks funny or, yeah. you know, this is intriguing or here's a random thought. Mm -hmm. Is there actually a process that you go through before you post? Oh yeah. As soon as I got on Instagram, really, I was like 13 or 14 and my parents were on it right away. So I've never posted anything crazy wow. ever. It's always a thought process. Well, how will this be received? And uh, what kind of message are you sending? And also, if you post something, it's going to be out there forever. So you got to make sure if it's really something you don't want people to see, don't post it. So Duff, tell me how the landscape has changed for you, even from the time that you recruited me and we started working together in 2002 as opposed yeah. to 2019. So now there's an expectation that higher profile athletes become mini moguls, right? So the social media universe, um, just the awareness you spoke of Duke and just coming into the game with all this, this following is, is just globally, like it's massive. And um, you know, RJ's probably as well known in China or India or Africa as he is here in the US. And so I'm always looking at how do we bring opportunities around that? But obviously your relationship with Yao over in China, sure. is that a, a market destination for him well, as well? Well, you know, I had gone to China and met Yao Ming when he was 16 and there was a blank landscape. So I kind of envisioned what this would be futuristically and that he would be the impetus for that. So that all materialized now, you know, there's a billion dollars worth of revenue merchandising shoe companies from China. I see that on the horizon in Africa next. Uh, over the course of the next 10 years or so. How do you vet all these opportunities that are coming his way? In this case, because of RJ's profile, um, particularly in Canada, uh, there's opportunities that are immediate that are very unusual. Hmm. Um, Royal Canadian Bank, for instance, uh, Rowan, his father worked there. There's a relationship they have with the family, so he's going to have a pretty significant endorsement relationship as a spokesperson, which is unbelievable for someone at his age to be aligned on, on a financial realm uh, is unprecedented. Is there a business goal outside of basketball that you would like to achieve? I want to own stuff. Like, I see Magic Johnson's with like the, the movie theaters or, or the Starbucks or something. I just want, I want like pieces, I want a piece of something. In the past, athletes just were participants. Now there's a partnership mentality. Just saw that Nick Nurse decided to be the head coach of the Canadian national team. Is that something that you want to do? I'm the type of guy that always plays for my country. So we haven't really decided, we don't really know what's going to happen yet. Um, 
you know, the NBA team may want you to come early and stuff like that. So we don't, we don't know what's going to happen yet. But, uh, you know, if I, if I had the opportunity, I would love to play. All right. TBD. TBD. That's a smart answer. There are other things that you want to do back at home? I always want to be a part of something, you know, in Canada, because that's really the place where I grew up. It's the place that made me. So I, I feel like I have, you know, an obligation or just a desire to make sure that everything is okay back home and that I kind of share my story with the rest of the people back home to to help them out and help you know our future kids see that you know they can one day do this and one day be in this position. I'm not scared, I'm ready to take the challenge head on. I feel like I'm built for it.